It is October the 30th, if my calendar has not betrayed me, which makes it Halloween Eve. I don't know what that means at your house, but at my house where we have 3.75 children, <laughs> there is a lot of excitement. Uh, All Hallows' Eve was the beginning of Halloween. It was actually an Eve, so really we're on the Eve, Eve of something, which doesn't make any sense, so I don't like that. But we are preparing for something at our house. didn't start that way. The first Halloween with our oldest, where we got him dressed up and he engaged in the process of trick-or-treating, was fantastic. Maybe you've seen the drill. You, you dress him up. Grammy, my mom, made him a clown costume. He had the red nose, the hair. Glorious. And we walked with him down the sidewalk and kind of told him, this is what you're going to do. You've got a, a, a bucket here, and you're going to say trick or treat, and people are going to put things in the bucket. But the concept was completely foreign to him at this point. He sort of just wandered around. Other trick or treaters, he would say trick or treat to. <laughs> people walking their dogs. You know, he just didn't get that he had a focused, uh, a purposeful thing. Not anymore. Cannon's in third grade now, and he understands the drill perfectly. Everyone is giving away candy and there is sugar in candy, and him and his younger brother ought to get as much of it as possible. So pace and strategy, locations, and, and what they're going to do to get more of that candy has begun to be part of the plan. They've figured out the purpose of the whole thing. It's not just so we can take cute pictures and dress up funny. It's that sugar's being given away. There's lots of surprises when you're raising kids. I didn't know all that would be there. Some of it's such awesome. One of the huge blessings is, I remember when I was trick-or-treating, my parents would say, okay, tomorrow we'll, we'll give you distributed your candy back to you and your sisters. Tonight we have to check it to make sure it's safe. I thought, isn't that great? My parents want to take care of me. What I've learned is, my kids being safe means they don't get my favorite candies. <laughs> Some of the A15 service said, my kid never had a Snickers until they got, you know, got one from the store because they didn't make it through the filtering process. The purpose is to celebrate, have kids out, and to get candy. Once aim and purpose are oriented, fruit is born. The journey may be a lot of fun, but destination matters. Not just for kids, but for adults. Holly and I, my wife, were in England years ago, and we were renting a car, which I don't know if you know about our English friends, but they drive oddly. The steering wheel's on the wrong side of the car. The cars are on the wrong side of the street. And driving is a bit of an adventure, but we are up for an adventure, and, and so off we go. I'm driving, Holly is navigating, and we are headed north, or so we think. See, the streets there are slightly different than here in Texas. It says uh, the city and town you're going to, and not, so if it would say, you know, 35, it would say I-35 Austin, not I-35 North. So we dropped on I-35 Pool. Headed north, because on my map there was a pool. It turns out, though, there's another pool, pool by the sea, and it's towards the south. So for an hour and a half, we drove the wrong way. We stopped at a petrol station, which I think is like a gas station, only more expensive. And I asked the person behind the counter, why, why doesn't it say the direction on the street? And the great response well, said that sometimes it goes this way and sometimes it goes that way, but it's always going to pool. Thank you. <laughs> no, I don't want any tea. I'll have a cup of coffee. Thank you. The journey is important. The destination matters. How we're oriented in our life, how we're structured in our disciplines and our commitments shape us into people along the way. Where we're going and who we are along the way matters deeply. We find our word from God today in Matthew's Gospel. It's in the great collection of witness called the Sermon on the Mount. Two weeks ago, we were in chapter 5. Now we're in chapter 6. It is preceded by the Beatitudes that we talked about where Jesus goes up the mountain. Remember, he sees the crowd. It's a great moment. Sees the crowd and goes the other way. He goes up the hill, and as soon the disciples follow and sit with him. So these are teachings for the committed. These are teachings for people who are following after Jesus, not the crowd that's interested in what miracles he might bring to their life, what healing he's been showing in the countryside. This is a group of people who want to follow Jesus and are committed to the movement he's leading. 
Before this, after the Beatitudes and that uh, sort of inverted worldview of the blessings we talked about a few weeks ago, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek, blessed are those who are oppressed, where Jesus invites us to see the world as it actually will be and almost is in his grace. And that blessed is not something we brag about on social media. Blessed is an orientation, connection, relationship to God that's not broken by our circumstances. So we may say when in prison, when sick, when ailing, when oppressed, we are indeed blessed. Our relationship with God has not been severed. Jesus goes on to teach in this sermon about almsgiving, that's uh, generosity to the poor, uh, about prayer, and about fasting, right before we get to the passage we're going to read today. And in all of those, the thread that winds through them is not to make a show, but instead make a difference. When we give, make sure it's the reward of the gratitude of the uh, God who, for whom we are giving on behalf of those to the poor who belong to him. When we pray, when we fast, don't make a show of it, Jesus says. I love the transformation reward to be internal. Orient your life in such a way that it isn't for the applause of others, but for the, what God can do in our hearts that we enter these disciplines. One more discipline he invites us to be a part of here in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consume, where thieves do not break in and steal. Don't place your treasure in a place where they can rot or be taken. Aim your treasure at a different place. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Recall that in the ancient world, in the Hebrew understanding, the heart was the center of being, identity. Where your treasure is, there your identity, there your orientation, there your aim will be also. And then 22 and 23 are strange. It's almost as if uh, it was another sermon that Matthew heard Jesus tell and he sort of just stuck it in the middle here. You know how these sermons can bleed together sometimes. You've heard a few of them. He says, the eye is a lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you in darkness is darkness, how great is the darkness? Okay. But if we went from 21 to 24, we would miss nothing. So for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 24 says this, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one or love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Recent Nobel Prize winner in literature, Bob Dylan, was right. Everybody's going to serve somebody. It's helpful, too, to note that love and hate are not fundamentally, in the biblical sense, emotional terms. When we say love or hate, we generally almost mean how we feel. But in the Bible, uh, recall the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob is a mess. He is uh, a liar. He's a cheat. Um... He is somebody who gets drunk before his wedding and so then marries the wrong sister. I've had weddings go poorly, but that would be a new one for me. (laughs) And if you think I'm being lewd on a Sunday morning, this is what the book says. He wakes up married to the wrong girl. His father-in-law's tricked him. He marries the other one, hangs around waiting for her for a year. Then he can cheat his father-in-law out of some cattle. He's a real peach. He's in exile in the first place because he cheated his brother stole his father's blessing, and ran off before Esau could take vengeance upon him. They eventually reconcile, and it seems that wisdom comes, but not after he wrestles with the truth. Walks a little differently after that encounter, if you know the story, and gets a new name. Jacob, the rascal, the cheater, becomes Israel, the name for which the God's people would be known. Jacob is said that God loves Jacob. Not not because Jacob was so sweet and great. I've told you a few things, highlights of his life that weren't great. Esau, the Lord hated. And we think, that seems mean to Esau. Okay, so he's hairy, Lord, but that's no reason. The difference is these aren't emotions from God. These are covenantal connections. Jacob, for all of his wandering ways, is willing to carry forward the promise that God has entrusted to his people. He is covenantally committed to the promise that his family's been entrusted since that blessing of Abraham years before. Esau trades that responsibility for a bowl of soup. Not because of how he felt, but because of who he was. 
He wouldn't take the responsibility. He wouldn't make the commitment. He's not covenantally connected. So he is in opposition to the covenant. That's hate. Rather than committed to the covenant, that's love. So here we have a servant who can't love both masters. That's not that we can't have love that grows affectionately feelings for more than one person. Surely we can in all kinds of different ways. It's that we can't be primarily committed to, covenantally bound to, one master and then another in the same way. So either, love, either money or, the, or God. We cannot serve both and be one individual. No one can serve both, God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Here is the reading, the word of God for the people of God. Are you sure? You are. You're much more confident than 815. They got scared instantly when I asked them if they were sure. Because it is October, and I read a passage from Matthew 6 about treasure. It's quite possible that you've wandered in to a sermon on stewardship. I know. The unease settles in quickly when you think, oh no, it's October. That letter came in the mail recently, and he read from Matthew 6. Let's just brace for it, honey. We'll get through it together. (laughs) Thanks be to God for this word. What is this word for us? So it seems that the lamp and light bit is stuck in the middle, but it it may just be that Matthew got it right. It may be that there's a connection between where our treasure is, how we see the world, and what we worry about. Where your heart is, your treasure has already arrived. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your eyes are filled with darkness, how great that darkness will be, you won't be able to see the goodness and mercy and truth of this world. If the shiny things and bright lights of this journey capture your attention in such a way that you're covenantally committed to them, how great is the darkness. And you'll be filled with anxiety and worry. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your body. Thanks. That's helpful, Jesus. That's what we worry about all the time. Food, clothing, our bodies. We worry all the time. Ancient problem. All the way back to the beginning when uh, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, the curse that Adam gets is that he will eat by the sweat of his brow. And I thought that meant, well, you know, it's ancient Near East. It's hot there. He'll work hard, and, and that'll mean he'll, he'll sweat in his forehead. But it turns out that that's an idiom. You know, idioms, when we say things like knock on wood in English, we don't mean well, you should go strike a piece of fibrous wood with your fist. You mean doing something for good luck. It's a, it's a phrase that means something different than the literal uh, phrasing. So too here we find that the sweat of the brow doesn't mean that he works hard. It means that he will be anxious. Adam and all of us who descended from him, daily bread we eat in this world, fallen and broken as it is, is worry. In the garden, there was food enough to eat, and I don't know if you've read the story, but clothing wasn't a big priority. Out of the garden, suddenly all of these things that were met and abundant and easy become hard and anxiety-ridden. And no matter how big a barn the descendants of Adams have built, no matter how much we've been able to sock away, we've never been able to stack up enough stuff to have enough, to buy enough, not to have this curse upon us. The anxiousness of our daily lives haunt the comfort we think we can buy. Oh, it's, it's something that I've struggled with as well. I, I know that, that that monster that comes and whispers to us all kinds of lies, that, that what if monster? What if the stock market crashes? What if oil drops again? What if my kids want to go to private college? What if they want to go to OU? That's a different struggle in my house. What if they want to go out of state? What, what, what if I aging parents need to be taken care of? What if I haven't put enough away? Those what if questions come and we worry about our bodies, what we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we'll wear. And the truth is, Jesus says, you cannot pile high enough in barns that we build and 401ks that we keep to not be anxious about today's daily bread. That is unless we are healed of the curse. 
The curse comes for those who are heirs to Adam. We are, but now, by the power of the cross, we're invited to be children of the promise as well. The cross inverts all these curses and makes them blessings. That's why a cross is at the center of our hope. An instrument of death and torture, of Roman oppression, is a symbol now of all those twisted and broken things being turned right side up. And so, too, we are invited to see in our hearts the light break in where darkness once reigned, confidence and faith where there was once anxiety and worry. And the spiritual discipline that invites us to be a part of this journey is generosity. It's the uh, invitation to give away that which the world thinks its safety and security is found in, and we're tempted to believe it as well. To give away a portion of our labors. The Old Testament biblical word for that was the tithe. They brought in the grain of the fields, if they were farming that. They brought in the grapes of the vine so they could make welches. They brought in the cattle or the sheep, the the wool or the the meat, and they would uh, make wine from the grapes, they would make bread from the grain, and they would make barbecue from the meat. And they would have a massive party. Look in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, these celebrations, these festivals, these are sacred celebrations of all that was good and holy. The tithe funded that. This wasn't a tax that you paid in a far-off land. It's something you didn't know about or connected to. This was your bit, your portion of the community's sacred celebration. A tithe is a a tenth, a ten percent that you may have heard. Um, And you're correct. I've had folks come tell me that's not in the New Testament. That is absolutely right. The New Testament standard uh, is the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? Yeah, somebody's read ahead. Trust me, you want the tithe. (laughs) Jesus will say, give it all away, because it's about his heart. Now, we get this wrong all the time, and the story is told, and I love it, that the chaplain of the U.S. Senate was meeting with a a, a young leader who had come into uh, great revenue and wealth, but was a believer, and said, "Uh, Pastor, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I I now make every year $500,000. If I was to give a tenth of that away, it'd be $50,000. That's a ton of money. There's no way. So the chaplain took his hand, as the story goes, and they prayed together. And he said, Lord, please reduce this man's salary back to a level he can afford to tithe again. (laughs) Now, $50,000 on $500,000 is what's called a gross tithe. Have you heard this game, gross and net tithe? Have you been a part of this? Oh, it's my favorite. Gross and net tithing. Gross tithing would be they give a salary, you take 10% of that, you give that away. Net tithing would be you take out what you pay in taxes, you take out what you put away for retirement, you're going to give on that later, uh, and then you get your, uh, your AGI for the accountants in the room or whatever number you want to use, uh, or your take-home number, and you take 10% of that. That'd be a net tithe. You know how I feel about that? Don't care. Don't care. It's not about getting the math right. Nowhere else in any other spiritual discipline do we say, hmm, how many Bible studies must I take for God to love me properly this year? I think four. Do we don't say, I guess if I prayed for 20 minutes today, I get the right allocation of my prayer. No, we understand, I think, in those areas that these disciplines shape and transform us. It's about what happens to a community committed to these disciplines of prayer, of worship, of service, and of giving that God's interested in. It's about getting the math right. It's about getting our hearts right. So wherever you're at, whatever your situation is, wherever you've been in your story, and I'll tell you, it's something that Holly and I have grown in. When we were first married, we gave what was left over at the end of the month, and sometimes that was negative. So that plate came by, and I'm just pulling it out. (laughs) Don't do that. Jesus will still love you, but your neighbor will judge you. And until we started putting that at the front end of our conversation about what our money was for, see, we think it's about what we have. It's about what we can do. Generosity is an invitation to move from ownership to utilization, from possession to the power that God wants to let loose in our lives. If you would only, if we would only open ourselves to what study, prayer, and generosity can do, then, oh, then, Lord, go to work and move in our midst. So wherever you are in that pick a standard number you want to take. It doesn't matter. It's not about the math. And then pick a percentage, not an amount. And there's a reason for that, because percentages can grow 
and move with you over time and with different levels of your income and adjust it downward. You pick an amount and you think that's the number. It's supposed to be a portion of your labor so that our whole hearts would be laid down before the Lord. Now this is the clever preacher part where I tell you that next Sunday is Commitment Sunday where we want you to make an estimate of giving, what they used to call a pledge. You fill out a card, you may have gotten it in the mail, and you, you bring it forward, and you said, next year, 2017, uh, I'm going to be able to give this, I think, and you hand it up here. But what you'll notice, if you were listening closely, Jesus didn't mention pledging. Not in the book. Not one time. Churches talk about it a lot. We like it. And the finance people in the room at E15 get very nervous when I get on this line of, of conversation. Doesn't mention this at all. It doesn't even say, you know what you should do if you figure out that number, take your number you want to give and take a percentage of that, you should give it all to University United Methodist Church. I looked in there a couple times, and it's not in there. We could make an allegorical argument that we're connected and heirs to the priests and the communities of the synagogues, maybe. But the truth is, it isn't about a church budget, it isn't about University United Methodist Church. Generosity is an invitation for our hearts to be transformed and for our lives to be aimed toward a purpose that we might fully appreciate the presence of God that gives us comfort that no amount of money in our bank accounts ever can. It's about what God can reveal to us when we trust and believe and don't worry. It's about our hearts. And I say that to say it's not an invitation to feel guilty, not mentioned either. It's an invitation not to feel not worried anxious or afraid. That means if you believe that there's a place in which God is moving and working and you figure out your number for this next year and you want to give it there and it's not here, give it with joy and gladness and the peace of this place. There are great organizations that you can invest in. There are places that make life better for people. There are places that extend life in the medical research that they do that you can be a a partner in. That's wonderful. Do that if you believe that's where God's calling you. What I believe about this place, though, is it's unique. While others improve life, they may extend life. Here, for me, life becomes real. It's in the community around which Jesus calls us to be a part of that my life finds meaning and purpose. That the breaths I take, the food I eat, isn't something I worry about. It's something that fuels the journey that God's called me into. It's here that I met forgiveness and my Lord. It's here that the darkness within me gets filled with light. It's here that I see other people get connected to what God's up to in the world. It's here that I see the invitation not just to life extended, not just to life improved, but life transformed, abundant, and eternal. So I want to aim my treasure at that. I want my heart to be in that and all of that. I I want to invite you to be a part of that in the coming months and years because I believe God is powerfully and purposely moving among us to achieve his ends for this neighborhood in and through this people called university. But don't for one moment believe that you'll get to heaven, you'll get to the resurrection, and God will say, I'd love to let you in, but you have a balance due. It doesn't work that way. It's a story of grace. Story of hope. Story of God who's already aimed his heart. He's already aimed his heart. And stunningly, amazingly, unbelievably, his treasure is us. Unbelievably, he's aimed his heart and his treasure to be invested in this bumbling, broken, hurting world where we are selfish and afraid. And he says, yeah, I I can work with that. I will meet you there and I will come amongst you and love you and shape you and forgive you and build in you a dream bigger than the life that you currently believe is possible. In the work of a a former church I was blessed to be a part of, we chose a geographic neighborhood that we thought we were called to neighbor and get to know. It was a pocket of uh, material poverty. That is, they didn't have a lot of financial resources, one of the poorest sections of the entire county. And it was just across the river from a pretty nice community that most of the folks in our church uh, lived in, six miles from the door of our church. And we started that journey by walking around and just meeting people in the neighborhood. And I met, met this one kid who was oh, in his early 20s, and he uh, was living with his grandmother there in a, a house, the two of them, the, the house was in uh, uh, her name, and they were living together. And he said, I, I'm working um, 
at selling cars in Houston, driving 45 minutes to get to work six days a week. I said, yeah, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? What do you, what do you hope for? What's, what, what are you dreaming? And he said, you know, I was talking to my grandma last night that uh, if I could get this together, I could make it right in a few years, I think maybe we could move to Pecan Grove. Well, that's where I lived. When you realize that you're living somebody else's dream, a couple things occur to you. One, that we're ungrateful so very often for all of the things that we take for granted on a daily basis. It may be that you too are living somebody else's dream. But I knew the people that lived in that neighborhood. I know the people that lived in my house. The lawns were taken care of. The appliances worked. Most of the countertops had been updated. But I knew the hearts. I bet you do too. They were anxious and afraid that no nice neighborhood, no manicured lawn, no updated kitchen could ever cover or coat. The dream must be big enough to extend to a life abundant where moth and rust and rot and thief can't steal, can't take or make us afraid. Store up for ourselves treasure in the abundant and eternal place. In the movement of God that's already breaking into this world and the great invasion of hope set loose in Easter that death itself and no enemy of hope can stop, that march is underway in our midst. The invitation for us is to study and to pray, to gather uh, and to sing, to worship, and yes, to give so that our hearts, our hopes, and our homes are set free and liberated from the tyranny of anxiety for which we always live. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I invite you to aim your treasure, not just your money, by the way, but your time. I don't know if you know this, but you can go and make more money. It's possible. You cannot make another moment of your life, another hour, another day. No, no worry on our part, no work on our part can extend our lives. Jesus tells us that in another passage. So it may be that the invitation in response to this word for you and for I is to look at our bank accounts and our calendars and see where our treasures are. Find out where we're aiming our hearts with our time, our talents, and our money. And if that's where we want our hearts to be, then aim away and double down and grow that generosity. And watch as God takes that and multiplies the power of his presence in the movement of God's spirit in your life. But if it isn't, here's the invitation. Tomorrow the sun will come up and hope can be yours and anxiety can go away around those things that you think must be owned or had or kept. Our hearts can be aimed, our treasure can be stored in a place where they are not fragile or stealable. And it begins by walking through the great paradox of the cross that turns that which was darkness in our eyes into light so that you and I might properly see the world as it really is, as it soon shall be, when all the worry and hurt of this world fade to dust and are no more. When the food is abundant, all the food that's coming, friends. When the clothes are filled with glory as God clothes those in glory that are in creation now. The hope that we are built for, the home that we are headed for, that's just around the next corner. Maybe just the next breath that these disciplines shape us for is a home of abundance and health, of joy and of laughter of family and of friends and of forgiveness and grace that never ends. Place your heart and your treasure there and watch as God invites us deeper into the movement and power of that spirit as he invades this world so that our prayer that we have already prayed will come true in and through us or even in spite of us that God's will would be done here on this bit of earth for which we are responsible as it already is in heaven.